Good morning, everybody. As you would no doubt have realized by now, there are two things that are difficult to talk about in India. One is cricket, and the other is Pakistan. And the reason is there are one billion experts in India who will tell you something about both these issues. In addition, a lot gets written about cricket, a lot gets written about Pakistan, and I'm sure you're already well informed about Pakistan and Indo-Pak relations. I read a lot, and you must have also seen on television, especially after the attack on Bulwar on 14th February. So I will not try and repeat what you may already know or have read about or have seen on television. Instead, I will take you on a different kind of journey to Pakistan and give you a flavor that you may not normally experience. I've divided the talk into four parts. I'll give you a brief introduction about myself, then some broad overview on issues that are important in understanding Pakistan. I also touch upon Pakistan's long-term security threats. And finally, I'll wind up with Pakistan's Kashmir fixation, Pakistan's mindset, and Indo-Pak relations. My interest in Pakistan began quite early in life, thanks to the stories that my father, an Indian Air Force officer, used to tell us about two Pakistan Air Force officers who were his flight commanders in the Royal Indian Air Force, flying Spitfires and Hurricanes during the Second World War over Burma, and also after the war. The wars of 1965 and 71 heightened my interest in Pakistan. In college and university, I studied the freedom struggle and the partition of India, and I was hooked. During my professional career, I studied Pakistan very closely over a period of years, for a number of years. After my retirement, I've read even more on Pakistan than I did while I was in service. And one thing that I've realized, that most of the attention on Pakistan tends to get focused on issues of terrorism, on cross-border, uh, infiltration on ceasefire violations and the stop go into pak relations. As a result, the real and serious problems of and in Pakistan tend to get ignored. So what I've done is, while not ignoring or um, uh, these issues, I've tried to study Pakistan beyond the beaten track, beyond the headlines, and sought answers to fundamental questions, like why is Pakistan a terrorist supermarket? Why it's frequently on the verge of being a failed state? Is there any way that its hostility towards India can be diminished? And so on and so forth. And the search for answers to these questions led to my first book, Pakistan Quoting the Abyss, and my second book, Pakistan at the Helm. The first talks about the critical issues in Pakistan, and the second talks about the leadership, the role the leadership has played. For me, the starting point in understanding Pakistan is that it did not begin on a clean slate in 1947, but carried with it the baggage and the legacy of the Pakistan movement. And three aspects I will highlight here. One was the opportunistic use of religion. Second was dependence on the British, as a result of which the development of the Muslim League as a movement and as a political party was totally stunted. And third, the Muslim League's quest for parity with the Congress and parity between Hindus and Muslims, which was transformed into a quest for parity, Pakistan's parity with India. I'll give you two examples. Jinnah had sanctioned the use of religion because the Muslim League was weak or did not have a presence in the areas that it claimed for Pakistan in the West. Uh, some of you who are familiar with history will realize that in Punjab, there was a coalition government of Hindu Sikhs and Muslims. In NWFP, there was a Congress government. It was only in Sindh that the Muslim League had some sort of a presence. Jinnah was opposed to mass mobilization the way Gandhiji did. He was opposed to land reforms. So the only way he could get support for the demand for Pakistan and for the Muslim League was to sanction the use of religion. And with the slogan like Pakistan ka matlab kya, and the answer being the kalma la ilaha illallah, there was no way that the religious genie could be put back into the bottle once Pakistan was created. Second, after Pakistan was created, Iskandar Mirza, who later on became Governor General of Pakistan, asked Jinnah to be considerate to the Muslim leaguers as after all they gave us Pakistan. Jinnah, who knew the insignificance of the Muslim League, dismissed it by retorting, who told you the Muslim League gave us Pakistan? I brought Pakistan with my stenographer. Unlike the Muslim League, unlike the Congress, the Muslim League had, not do had done no homework on how Pakistan was to be governed. Even the British cautioned Jinnah that since he had done no preparation, he would be in for a shock. The infirmities of the Muslim League would allow the army to step into politics and remain there. Pakistan continues to contend with the negative consequences of such a legacy even today. 
The second issue in understanding Pakistan is that of identity, and this is a very critical and a vital issue. These were two reasons. First, the geographical area that came to constitute Pakistan in the east and west had never before existed as a single country. It was therefore necessary to weld the various nationalities living in these geographical areas into a single Pakistani identity. Second, the identity had to be different and distinct from India since Pakistan had been carved out of India. India was a historical entity, but Pakistan was a newly created country with an unfamiliar name that had to be acknowledged by the world as such. In fact, as the English language paper of Pakistan, the Dawn, put it as late as 2000. Since its inception, Pakistan has faced the monumental task to spell out an identity different from the Indian identity. Born from the division of the old civilization of India, Pakistan has struggled for construction, constructing its own a culture that will not only be different from the Indian culture, but that the whole world would acknowledge. This need for distinctiveness led to the emphasis of an identity that was Islamic, taking its cue from the two-nation theory that was the philosophy behind Pakistan's creation. Resultantly, creating a Pakistani identity required erasing any Indianness within Pakistan and denying the Indianness of Pakistan's identity meant emphasizing the Hinduness of India and reinforcing the Islamic nature of Pakistan. The world professor put this across beautifully, a Pakistani professor, when he said, if we let go of the ideology of Islam, we cannot hold together as a nation by any other means. If the Arabs, the Turks and the Iranians give up Islam, the Arabs will remain Arabs, the Turks remain Turks and the Iranians remain Iranians. But what do we remain if we give up Islam? And somebody said we will remain second-rate Indians. That's why you'll find in many conversations and television talk shows and in books, the stress is always to portray India as Hindu and as opposed to a Muslim Pakistan. Of late, the trend is to locate its identity in the sands of Arabia, and this is reflected in changes in language. Thus, Khuda Hafiz has become Allah Hafiz, Ramzan has become Ramadan, Namaz is becoming Salat, and Pakistan itself is becoming Al Pakistan, and God forbid, the land of the five rivers Punjab will soon become Punjab. Because in Arabic there is no per, so this becomes Punjab. Now, the problem with emphasis of an Islamic identity is that the opportunistic use of Islam was effective in creating a country by whipping up hysteria and communal passions but was not effective as glue to keep the country together. This was because in the areas that came to constitute Pakistan there were historical states with significant linguistic, cultural and ethnic diversities. Here people instinctively thought of themselves as Bengalis, Baloch, Pashtuns, Serakis and Sindhis rather than as Pakistanis. And Wali Khan, the famous Pashtun leader, put it across beautifully when he said in the National Assembly. I have been in Pashtun for thousands of years, a Muslim for 1300 and a Pakistani for just over 40. Clearly for him and for millions of others, the specific ethnic identity was far more important than a Pakistani identity. In fact, Maulana Azad, a famous Indian leader during the uh, freedom struggle, put it, the basic problem with an Asik identity he held was that Jinnah's thesis that Islam could form the basis of a nationhood was wrong. And I quote it, it, that is Pakistan is being demanded in the name of Islam. Division of territories on the basis of religion is a contraption devised by the Muslim League. They can perceive it as their political agenda, but it finds no sanction in Islam or Quran. In fact, the Quran talks about Qom, which is a composite culture, composite concept of both believers as well as non-believers. That's why Jinnah didn't like Murana Azad at all. Now surprisingly, into the seventh decade of its creation, Pakistan has not been able to establish an overarching Pakistani identity. Alienation of different ethnic groups, despite being Muslims, continues to be a persistent phenomena in Pakistan. East Pakistan broke away to become Bangladesh because language was a more important part of the Bengali identity than Islam. A fifth insurgency is waging in Baluchistan. There is unrest among the Pashtuns and Serakis and Sindhis, despite all of them being Muslims. Now, given this failure to create a national identity by any other means, Pakistan has resorted to Plan B, which is raising the threat from India as a cement to bind the multiple identities of Pakistan. The narrative became that India is out to undo partition. Pakistan has thus failed to resolve the contradiction between denying any Indianness in its identity and failure to look beyond India by clinging to the two-nation theory. While this can hardly be the basis for a sustainable national identity, 
it has implications for Indo-Pak relations. In fact, as soon as India became the negative reference point for defining Pakistani nationalism, there is no way Pakistan could develop a new and positive identity for itself or develop normal relations with India. Pakistan would need a Hindu India always as a reference point for its raison on the earth and its national identity would continue to be a negative anti-India narrative. Such an attitude towards India and Hindus has been reinforced by the government approved school curriculum in government schools. A Pakistani study which studied the textbooks in Pakistan, one of the conclusions it reached was hatred against India and the Hindus has been an essential component of the ideology of Pakistan because for its proponents, the existence of Pakistan was defined only in relation to Hindus and hence the Hindu had to be painted in an as negatively as possible. Now, India, on the other hand, has accepted the unit, the, in a principle of unity and diversity. Pakistan ignored the diversity of its people and tried to superimpose an Islam-based Pakistan identity on the dominant ethno-linguistic identity. This failure to acknowledge ethnic diversity in the elusive quest of an Islam-based national identity was a challenge in 1947. It remains a challenge even after 70 years. The third issue in understanding Pakistan is Islamization. Incremental doses of Islamization, starting with the Objective Resolution of 1949 and Ziya's Islamization Drive, have led to intolerance, insecurity, and where the persistent killing of Shias is being called genocide. Each sect of Islam today has its own set of madrasas in different cities and localities in which primacy is given to arguments to attack and demolish the other sects. It is this narrow tunnel vision of Islam that is being imbibed by successful generations of Pakistanis. Those of you who are interested could Google and look at this Munir Commission report. This was a report uh, commission that was set up in 1953-54 after the anti Ahmadiyya riots in Lahore. And this is one of the best documents to ever come out of Pakistan. And uh, the Justice uh, Munir and Justice Kiani, they talked to about 30 alims um, uh, from different sects and asked them a simple question that, you know, if you want Ahmadiyyas to be declared non-Muslims, you must first of all know who is a Muslim. So what is your definition of a Muslim? And they write that to their regret, none of the 30 alims could agree on a common definition of who is a Muslim. He said, if you follow one definition, then all the 29 others become kafir and an Islamic state will be wajib e -Katl. So this was the kind of differences in 1953. And you can imagine since then, the Islamization drive has pushed sectarianism to a position where different sects of Islam are almost at war with each other and where the killing of Shias is being called genocide. It's a brilliant report. Those of you who are interested further should actually read it. I'll give one example of where the various doses of Islamization have taken Pakistan to. <clears throat> it's slightly gruesome, but it explains graphically what is, happened to, what is happening to Pakistan. In January 2016, in district Okara, a 15-year-old boy apparently misheard a question related to the Holy Prophet and mistakenly raised his hand. The local prayer reader and a section of the congregation pounced on him, accusing him of blasphemy. To atone for his mistake, this poor boy went into the agricultural field nearby and using a fodder cutting machine, chopped off his own hand and presented this appendage to the preacher on a plate. The boy's family celebrated the action. And in English daily, the nation noted aptly, if people are ready to hurt themselves in the name of religion, Imagine what they would be willing to do to others. And the Daily Times asked ominously, the sheer savagery of this act compels one to ask, have we really been driven to the edge of insanity in a subservience to the Maulvis and the Mullahs that we now chop off our limbs in order to acquire the status of a believer? During the last seven decades, the space and opportunity for Pakistan to be a moderate and inclusive state has shrunk enormously. Religious intolerance confined to pockets at one stage is now widespread. The warning signs for the next generation are everywhere. The huge pool of madrasa educated unemployable youth as also the millions coming out of governmental schools imbued with hatred of others in a stagnant economy would be cannon fodder for jihadi outfits that thrive on a culture of intolerance. The fourth issue in understanding Pakistan is parity. Desire for parity with India, military, political and regional parity. This obsessive and fixated search for parity harks back to the history of the subcontinent. Believing itself to be inheritors of a millennia of Islamic rule, 
over the Indian subcontinent, especially of the Mughals, Pakistan feels that its inheritance demands that it be treated as an equal, if not superior, to India. The core of the Muslim League's demand for a separate Muslim homeland, that is Pakistan, was the two-nation theory, that the Hindus and Muslims were two separate nations. This led to a quest for parity with the Congress and parity between Hindus and Muslims in a representative system, despite the fact that Muslims were in a numerical minority. This quest for parity, rather than being buried with the creation of Pakistan, was carried over into the new state and parity with India has become a fixation with its leaders and especially with the Pakistan army. It is this quest that makes and defines them as Pakistanis. Without assertion of such parity, they would be seen to have acquiesced to Hindu subjugation. In this elusive search for parity with India, Pakistan has adopted several strategies over the decades and continues to adopt unmindful of the consequences for its own survival. These include the use of terrorists to inflict a thousand cuts in order to soften India for talks, development of nuclear weapons, use of borrowed power, la relatively large expenditure on defense, both conventional and nuclear. The implication is that Pakistan will always act as a spoiler to ensure that India does not get something that it does not get. For example, a seat of the United Nations Security Council or membership of the nuclear supplies group. Two other issues which I'll run through, which I don't think so, you must be already know about it. One is terrorism. While Islamization had a certain salience in a country created on the basis of religion, the growth of jihadi terrorism and violence prevalent in Pakistan today is a result of deliberate state policy. Given the roots of terrorism in Pakistan, it is unlikely that the Pakistan state would relent on using terrorist organizations as instruments of state policy. The other issue is of army and civil military relations. These go to the heart of governance <coughs> and democracy in Pakistan. The fact that the army dominates is not disputed, but why it does so is hotly debated. While the army dominates the polity and the linked issues of why civilian governments have been unable to control the army and the implication of army's domination are core issues in understanding Pakistan. The seventh issue in understanding Pakistan is the use of violence. It is undisputed that Jinnah had strong faith in constitutionalism and he even agreed, disagreed with Gandhiji's policy of civil disobedience movement to fight the British. Yet, when it came to the crunch, it was Jinnah who gave a call for direct action in 1946 to achieve Pakistan through unconstitutional means if necessary, which led to mass killings in Calcutta. Through violence, Jinnah wanted to conclusively demonstrate that Hindus and Muslims could not stay together. Another example was the Jinnah commissioned Iskandar Mirza, who was then a deputy commissioner in the Northwest Frontier Province and later the Governor General of Pakistan, in February 1947 to raise a tribal Lashkar to be used in the Northwest Frontier Province to rouse the Pathans in favor of the Muslim League. He told Iskandar Mirza that Muslim anger had to be properly demonstrated as otherwise the British would hand over the country to the Congress. He declared that if Pakistan could not be won through negotiations, it would have to be won by the will of the Muslims. He therefore decided that if negotiations failed by the middle of May, the Muslims must make a dramatic statement. While Mirza started preparations for this, ultimately the demand for Pakistan was conceded and he was not called upon to implement Jinnah's plan. However, since Iskandar Mirza became Defense Secretary in 1947, his experience with tribal Lashkars came in handy to organizing the raiders into Kashmir in October 1947. One lesson that successive generations of Pakistani leaders have imbibed from this was that it was only force that the Hindus, that is India, understood. Some examples. Ayub Khan put it so graphically in a directive about the objectives of Operation Gibraltar to the Commander-in-Chief General Musa on 29th August 1965 when he wrote, As a general rule, Hindu morale would not stand more than a couple of blows delivered at the right time and place. Such opportunity should therefore be sought and exploited. As his biographer Aldaf Gohar put it, the Hindu has no stomach for a fight. And to quote Ayub again, the political aim for the struggle for Kashmir, for struggle in Kashmir was to weaken India's resolve and bring her to the conference table without provoking a general war. The use of violence into the Pakistani psyche has over the decades mutated into the concept of terror. Based on their perception of the Muslim rule of the subcontinent and precedence, Pakistan has held that the Hindu, that is the Indian, was submissive. Consequently, through terror alone, a decision could be imposed upon him. 
according to Brigadier Malik's Quranic concept of war, which is compulsory reading in army establishments in Zia's time, once the condition of terror into the opponent's heart is obtained, hardly anything is left to be achieved. In fact, terror is not a means of imposing a decision upon the enemy. It is the decision that is to be imposed upon him. It is this belief in terror as a means of warfare that has been used to justify covert Pakistani terrorist attacks in Kashmir and other parts of India. The argument is that through terrorism, it would be possible to force India to the negotiating table in a weakened position. To strike terror into the hearts of the enemy, his faith must be weakened, whereas the Muslim soldier must adhere even more firmly to his own religion. Furthermore, this standard of terror is equally applicable to nuclear as well as conventional wars, thus making terror an adjunct to Pakistan's nuclear strategy. An interesting example of how the faith of the enemy is weakened was the briefing given to Benazir Bhutto during a first dinner <coughs> as Prime Minister in August 1989 by Generals Imran Lulna and Ayaz at the Brigade Headquarters in Dunsum on the situation in Siachen. She was told of the alleged faint-heartedness of the enemy, Indians fleeing at the mere sight of Pakistani troops, asking for negotiations as soon as the going got tough and so on. When Benazir asked General Ayaz why the Indians showed such lack of combativeness, he said it is a question of motivation. When our men fight, they are fighting for Allah and Islam. They go forward with the cry of Allah Akbar on their lips. He added, when five times a day a call to prayer reverberates across the mountains, the Indians found silent. The Azan, the general affirmed, had a very uplifting effect on the morale of his men and the opposite effect on that of the enemy. I mention this example specifically so that you are aware of the kind of mindset the Pakistan army has. These are not merely motivational speeches, but these are widely held beliefs that you should be aware of. Now, unfortunately for Pakistan, forceful and successful Indian reaction has invariably refuted such assumptions and surprised the Pakistanis, and many Pakistani leaders have lived to regret such a fallacy. For example, led to believe that one Pakistani Muslim soldier was equal to 10 Hindu Indian soldiers the inability to take Kashmir in 1965 was a rude awakening to the Pakistan public. Writing about the Indian victory in Bangladesh, Ayub Khan wrote in his diary, on Thursday, December 16, 1971, I suppose the Hindu morale is now very high. It is the first victory they have had over the Muslims for centuries. It has taken us a long time. It will take us a long time to live this down. Another example, when he was in exile, Nawaz Sharif told a journalist, that the entire Northern Light Infantry had perished in Kargil, 2,000 martyred and hundreds wounded. The death toll was higher than the 1965 and 1971 wars put together. After such heavy casualties, when he asked Musharraf about army losses, Musharraf said Indians were carrying out carpet bombing, something that they did not expect Indians to do. Let me turn to some security issues. Pakistan faces several security, critical security issues. The situation in Afghanistan, relationship with the United States, developments relating to the Financial Action Task Force, the tense situation on the line of control. The one silver lining is it's all with the friendship with China and the potential the China-Pakistan economic corridor has in boosting Pakistan's economy. However, I view security threats in a longer perspective. And for me, the two most critical challenges faced by Pakistan are the looming water prices and its demographic profile. Let me turn to water first. Agriculture is critical for Pakistan. 60% of Pakistan's population depends on it. It accounts for about 20% of the GDP and 70% of Pakistan's exports depend on agro-based products. Being an arid country, about 95% of all water is used in agriculture, both surface and groundwater. The problem is that today Pakistan has become a water scarce country. Its per capita availability has shrunk to a low of about 900 cubic meters per capita per annum, the population of 207 million, from 5,650 cubic meters per capita per annum in 1951, when the population was 32.5 million. The country is expected to become absolute water scarce, less than 500 cubic meters per capita per annum by 2025, according to the Pakistan Council for Research in Water Resources, and that's about seven or eight years from now. Absolute water scarcity incidentally means drought-like conditions in parts of the country. Now, the situation is going to get worse because of climate change. Already, a reduction in the long-term average availability of water has been noticed. Practically speaking, 
This has resulted in a decline in water availability during the Rabi season, which is the crop being grown now, sown in October, December, harvested in April, May. During the 2017-18 Rabi season, the water shortage was estimated to be 30 to 40 percent. And likewise, in the current crop 2018, there is again a 30 to 40 percent water shortage. Kharif of 2018, there was a 40 to 50 percent shortage in the sowing phase, leading to about half a million acres not being sown in Punjab. And in Sindh, only about 30 percent of the land was be able to be sown. Water scarcity will increasingly heighten food insecurity and lead to greater unemployment as the agricultural sector shrinks. How this will impact 60 percent of the population that is dependent on agriculture is a critical issue. Even the estimates of population of 220 million in 2025, it could be even more because these estimates were before the last census. The gap between availability and demand of water is projected to be about 74 million acre feet. And to put this in perspective, this is almost two thirds of the Indus River's current average annual flow. And this is without India utilizing fully its share of the Indus, 3.6 million acre feet, and Afghanistan not storing the waters of the Kabul, and they can store about 4.7 million acre feet. From where does Pakistan get another Indus River? The second security issue is that of population. It's growing at 2.4% coupled with inadequate education and its demographic profile. You'll all recall having studied in uh, college, Malthus in his 1798 masterpiece, an essay on the principle of population. I looked at total population and had projected the Malthusian catastrophe which is that the population is growing in geometric proportions, food grows in agricultural, in arithmetic proportion, and therefore there will be either war or famine and the population will get reduced. Modern-day demographers look at not total population, but look at age structures. Based on the reality that the working age population produces more than it consumes, whereas the young and the old consume more than they produce. So any country that has a larger portion of working age population relative to the young and the elderly has the potential for a demographic dividend. Pakistan's working age population of between 15 to 64 touched 52% in the early 1990s and is currently estimated to be about 60.4%. It will peak at 68% on 2045 and then it will start declining as the population starts aging. So the potential demographic dividend for Pakistan is between 1990 and 2045. Of these 55 years, 28 years have almost passed without any visible uptick in economic activity. To actualize the demographic dividend, the basic question is whether those entering the labor market can be absorbed productively. In Pakistan's case, the population summers from a double, double whammy. Inadequate education with almost 50% of school children out of schools and an economy providing only between 600,000 to a million jobs annually, while the annual entry into the labor force is about 3 million and will be for the next three decades. What happens to the 2 to 2.5 million people who are poorly educated and unemployed? In other words, what happens if the demographic dividend is not realized? The flip side of an unrealized demographic dividend is that the massive youth bulge could pose a serious threat to law and order, including in Pakistan's case of terrorism. The danger for Pakistan is that without sustained economic growth and without investment in education, the demographic dividend would degenerate into a demographic hoard with all its attendant consequences of frustration, alienation and violence. Such a hoard would become cannon fodder for the various jihadi organizations with internal and external agendas. So the bottom line is, it is obvious that Pakistan is faced with hydro hydrohydrate problems, increasingly diminishing water supplies, an uneducated horde of young people, an economy on the drip, lack of jobs and a growing radicalized population. Such a combination poses serious security challenges that the army too would have a tough time to control. Nuclear weapons, non-state actors, even Chinese assistance may not help Pakistan in tackling these kind of security issues. There are no shortcuts here. Pakistan will have to make massive investments in its water infrastructure, education and the economy to stay afloat. There are no signs that it is doing so. Let me now turn to Kashmir. For Pakistan, Kashmir was and is the unfinished agenda of partition. It is the K in the acronym Pakistan. Jinnah called Kashmir Pakistan's Sharag or Jigalar. Kashmir acquired greater salience after Bangladesh broke away from Pakistan. Issues of revenge against India apart, 
the creation of Bangladesh effectively buried the two-nation theory and the use of Islam to weld a national identity. Even though rationalizations were made about Islam not being effectively used by a secularized elite, the fact was that Pakistan needed another crutch as an ideological nationalist narrative. This crutch became the ideology of Pakistan of which Kashmir was an integral part. A historian, El Zering, has put this beautifully that no Pakistani leader, present or future, was allowed to ignore the significance of the Himalayan territory and especially its connection to Pakistan. All of Pakistan was made hostage to the Kashmir conundrum. As a result, Pakistan's position on Kashmir is frozen in time and without an alternative strategy. Its military strategy to wrest Kashmir from India in 1947, 1965 and 1999 has repeatedly failed. Its semi-military strategy of using terrorists since 1989 to force India to come to the negotiating table in a weakened position has not been successful either. It has failed to develop a coherent political strategy except to intermittently raise the issue of human rights violations. This hasn't worked either. Being a state sponsor of terrorism, the international community is not listening to Pakistan. The developments pertaining to the Financial Action Task Force are testimony to this. But despite repeated failures, Pakistan will not relent on Kashmir. And why is this so? I think Zulfikar Ali Bhutto gave the best explanation in 1969 in his book, The Myth of Independence. It's a rather long quote, but I think it's well worth it. He wrote, why does India want Jammu and Kashmir? And then he replies, she retains the state against all norms of morality because she wants to negate the two-nation theory, the basis of Pakistan. If a Muslim majority area can remain a part of India, the raison on the ether of Pakistan collapses. For the same reason, Pakistan must continue unremittingly a struggle for the rights of self-determination of this subject people. It would be fatal if in sheer exhaustion or out of intimidation, Pakistan were to abandon the struggle and a bad compromise would be tantamount to abandonment, which might in turn lead to the collapse of Pakistan. If, however, we settle for tranquil relations with India without an equitable resolution of disputes, it would be the first major step in establishing Indian leadership in our parts, with Pakistan and other neighboring states becoming Indian satellites. In this one paragraph, you have the philosophical underpinnings of Pakistan's Kashmir policy. Though Bhutto was hanged by the army, his articulation of Pakistan's relentless quest for Kashmir has been followed assiduously by all subsequent rulers, civil and military. The elements he identified, especially the impact of a Muslim majority province in India on Pakistan's raison on the earth, are the bedrock of Pakistan's Kashmir policy. In fact, Bhutto had always uh, articulated that only by sustaining the tempo and degree of tension could the situation be qualitatively altered. And he said, confrontation, confrontation, confrontation is the key to the Indo-Pakistan dispute. What we see happening on the line of control, for example, or terror attacks like in Pulwama are an illustration of precisely such a prescription. Let me now turn to the Pakistani mindset. One of the important lessons that I have learned in studying Pakistan is to understand what is its mindset when it comes to India. Or how does Pakistan view India? How does Pakistan see India? The various elements of the Pakistani mindset towards India have been distilled in a publication titled India, a study in profile by Lieutenant Colonel and later Lieutenant General Javed Hassan for the Command and Staff College, Quetta. It is widely read and it is prescribed reading in various army institutions. After an analysis of 2000 years of Indian history, the study concludes, and I'll quote from some of the conclusions. One, India has a poor track record at projection of power beyond its frontiers. Two, it has a hopeless record in protecting its own freedom and sovereignty despite having larger armies. Three, dismal performance of the military is matched by the near total absence of any popular resistance against foreign domination. India is unviable and Pakistan only needs to give it a push and this artificial Hindu state would implode. Terrorist acts like the one in Pul uh, Pulwama are precisely the push that Pakistan is looking for. How does this mindset work? And let me give you a practical example. Given his views on the Hindus and thus on India, it is hardly surprising that Javed Hassan, who by 1999 was force commander in other areas, was one of the infamous four who together with Musharraf, 
Chief of General Staff Mohammed Aziz and Co-Commander Tenko Mahmood Ahmed planned a scheme like Kargil. The whole scheme was based on the assumption underlined by Hassan on how the Hindu would cave in before a superior power. Such a massive miscalculation based on half-baked knowledge and a priori assumptions can have disastrous consequences in the future, given that both countries are nuclear weapon powers. Such attitudes reflect the Pakistan Army's civilizational hostility towards India, and this is unlikely to change in the near or medium term. Sorry, should I put this? This is unlikely to change in the near and medium term. To conclude, in such a scenario, the obvious question is that is Pakistan's hostility towards India eternal? Are Indo-Pak relations going to continue going through this and will you be keep reporting back to your headquarters of the status of Indo-Pak relations? I think the facts to consider are as follows. Pakistan has chosen to define its identity as being anti-Indian. This anti-Indianness is relentless, almost immutable, is in Pakistan's DNA. It believes it can maintain its vital interests only by confronting India. Else, capitulation by, capitulation by installments and even liquidation. Where conventional war is problematic, it has resorted to terrorism. Kashmir is the pivot of the mindset. And since Pakistan has internalized that to keep alive and rejuvenate the two-nation theory, a Muslim-majority state as Kashmir cannot be allowed to remain with India since it demolishes the raison the aether of Pakistan. Thus, Pakistan has to continue her unremitting struggle for Kashmir. Various elements of the psyche have combined to freeze the grooves of any talks between India and Pakistan. Any initiative that India takes has ground to dust precisely because they adversely impact Pakistan's ideological and security narrative. Indo-Pak dialogue since 1947 has been characterized by a roller coaster of expectations and disappointments. There has been no forward movement on contentious issues. If you go back in history, there were the famous Nehru Liaquat talks, the Soren Singh Bhutto talks of 1962-63, the composite dialogue process of the 1990s. The results have been the same. Some positive movement on connectivity, trade, visas, and so on. A major achievements were the Indus Water Treaty of 1960 and the 2003 ceasefire. On Kashmir, terror attacks against India, there has been no forward movement at all. It's only when Pakistan re-examines its, examines its roots, stops seeking its identity in anti-Indianness, stops its futile pursuit of parity with India, in a word, drastically changes its psychology and mindset towards India, would there be a possibility of any real progress in bilateral relations. Thank you very much.